Hey there, welcome to Livewire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week on the show, we are talking to a legend. And I mean that, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot, but in this case, it's very well-deserved. Filmmaker, actor, and iconic tiny mustache haver, John Waters is gonna be here talking about his first foray into fiction writing, which he's done with his latest book, Liar Mouth, and what it's like for him as a famously shocking, kind of lewd, transgressive artist to be recognized by children in airports. Then we're gonna be talking to the writer Sasha LaPointe about how the TV show Twin Peaks impacted her life as a young native woman in the Pacific Northwest. And as if all that weren't enough, we're gonna wrap things up with a musical performance from one of our very favorite bands, Deep Sea Diver. That is the plan, don't go anywhere, because it all gets started right after this. They say the only constant in life is change, which is true, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the changes in our lives. A slight change of plans from Pushkin Industries is here to help. It's hosted by Dr. Maya Shunker, a cognitive scientist who is an expert on human behavior, and it's a show all about who we are and who we become in the face of big change. A Slight Change of Plans features incredible stories of transformation from guests like Ruby Bridges, who at six years old became a civil rights icon, and Christy Warren, first responder who, after enduring psychological trauma from helping others in emergencies, bravely sought out help for herself. Blending science with storytelling, a slight change of plans will leave you thinking differently about change in your own life. Listen to A Slight Change of Plans wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It is going great this week. Are you ready for a little station location identification examination? Hold on one second. Let me roll up my sleeves. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. This is where I ask you about a place in the country where Livewire is on the radio. You've got to guess the place I'm talking about. This is a place where the actor James Earl Jones first began acting in the Ramsdell Theater. Hmm. First began acting. So not where he's from, where he got his first job. Is it Jonesboro, Arkansas? (laughs) It's a little north. It's a little north of there. How about another hint? A great fire occurred in this city the same day as the Great Chicago Fire back in 1871. Uh, This town is also associated with the salt industry and even has a Morton salt factory on one of its lakes. Is it Grand Haven, Michigan? (laughs) It is in Michigan. I'm going to give it to you. It's actually Manistee, Michigan. Manistee! We were on the radio on (laughs) WLMN. Shout out to everyone in Manistee, Michigan. (laughs) All right, should we get to the show? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... This week, filmmaker John Waters... I took LSD when I was 70 to see what it would be like. I hitchhiked when I was 66 across the country. I keep trying to dare myself. I'm the evil Knievel of uh, nutcases. And writer Sasha LaPointe. The work of healing is so much harder and way more worthwhile than self-medicating. With music from Deep Sea Diver and our fabulous house band. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now the host of Livewire, Luke Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone joining us from all over the country. We have a great show in store for you this week. Uh, We have a question that we ask the audience, as we often do. The question is, if you could have anything named after you, what would it be? This is because of something in the greater Baltimore area that is named for John Waters that we're going to find out about coming up. We're going to hear the audience responses in a minute. First, though, we got to kick things off with the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder at the top of the show. There is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news that you heard all week? Okay, uh, before I start with the news, I have to give you a fun fact. Did you know that in San Francisco, no resident is ever farther than a 10-minute walk from a park? No. And that's exciting because this best news involves a park service parking attendant named Amanda Barrows, who during the pandemic decided that she wanted to take up poetry. 
And she took a couple of classes and ended up in a class at the City College of San Francisco called Poetry for the People. And it's like a field project class about how you can make poetry more accessible for the greater community that you live in. And she was like, well, I mean, I I basically run the parks as a parking attendant, so I'm going to do a poetry in the parks project. So her final project had to be a major outreach event. She had to do some kind of big community focused activity. And a colleague of hers was like, well, I got this old nightstand. Could you do anything with that? And she was like, yes. So in right, you know where the full house theme title sequence was that part of Golden Gate Park? Yes. (laughs) I have visited that park because of its prominence in the full house intro. Samesies. She put this nightstand out there with a bunch of pen and paper and stuff in one of the drawers. And then in another one of the drawers were some starter poems that other people had written to get people excited and inspired. And she encouraged the people to take a poem or leave a poem on the sign. And she started doing this in December. And every four days or so, she's been moving this nightstand to different locations in all those parks that I was talking about all over San Francisco. Sometimes people write down their favorite poems that are written by other poets like Mary Oliver. And sometimes people write poems like this one. The wind graces this park like an airy whisper as the sounds of longing echo from the nearby piano. Wow. Yeah. It's very poetic. It's just this cool way of being like, you know what? Poetry's everywhere. It's not at City Lights Books only, you know, in Mm -hmm. San Francisco. It's not at the public library. It's not in a class. It's this connection between being out in the world and feeling inspired or wanting to be inspired or wanting to connect, which I think is just so amazing. That's incredible. I feel like I have the weirdest relationship with poetry in that I, I I think of it sometimes as being a little abstract or maybe hard for me to access or very sort of artsy, but every time I encounter it, whether it's someone on this show or just out in the world like that, I find it so moving. I mean, it is an incredibly moving way to communicate. Yeah, I think it's the literature of our emotional selves. Like it's the em- emotional genre. Like where it's the, we're trying to make the closest connection to where we are inside with what's happening, the people that we want to talk to outside of ourselves. So, that is yeah. such a great way to describe it. I'm a very emotional person, which is why it probably resonates with me. You know what's making me feel emotional this week, Elena? It's making me feel happy is Mo Mountain Mutts of Skagway, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best news I saw this week. Have you seen these pictures of these <laughs> these dogs on the bus going to have their uh, little adventure time? This is a husband and wife in uh, Skagway, Alaska, Mo and Lee Thompson. Uh, they were working in the food service industry, and uh, Lee was working as a teacher. And then the pandemic hit, of course, and everybody's life changed. And they decided to sort of lean into something they were really into, which was taking care of dogs and taking dogs on walks. And so they started this little bus service called Mo Mountain Mutts. And they started, uh, you know, picking up dogs in the neighborhood and taking them out. And then the operation really took off. Now they've got like more than 40 dogs. They had to buy a new, like a school bus. <laughs> yep. And <laughs> these videos of the dogs very like in a very orderly fashion, boarding the bus mm-hmm. and yeah. sitting very properly with their little leash on and everything has just like lit the internet on fire on TikTok and uh, Instagram. It is the most adorable thing that I've ever seen. They also have a kind of a, a way of keeping the different personalities kind of, you know, in the right part of the bus. They have uh, something called a licky puppy corner. <laughs> so if you're a licky puppy and you're going on a Mo Mountain adventure, you'll be in one part of the bus for licky puppies, then the like slightly more mature dogs are in another section. And it is like it's just incredible to see how sort of well behaved these dogs are. I think the some of the owners say that the dogs, when they hear the bus coming down the road, they like sit like at attention, like right by mm-hmm. the door, like they hear that the Mo Mountain mutts are there to get them and they are like very excited about it. I'm going to make you so jealous right now. We have this in Corvallis. What? We have a school bus called the K9 Kindergarten Camp that picks up a dog on my street 
and everything you say is true. Sometimes I'll just be working by uh, my window faces the street and a school bus will go by with like, instead of a kid's head, it's like a St. Bernard's head at every window and like a <laughs> Labrador. The dogs race out. They get driven to the mountains in between here and the Oregon coast. And apparently when they come back at the end of the day, A, the bus looks totally different. The windows are so foggy. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> a lot of <laughs> drool. Yeah. And the dogs apparently are so exhausted they just pass out for the rest of the day because they've had the best day. But anytime I see the school bus, I feel like it's an omen that I'm going to have a really good day. If I pass by it, it's just such a great additional delight in addition to the service that it provides. How could your day not get better after seeing that? My buddy Mike, when I lived in New York, he lived in a New York apartment and he had a boxer named Rumsfeld that was enormous. And they would send the dog to like some kind of doggy daycare in New York. But for whatever reason, that dog daycare used a limo. I think it was like <laughs> literally like the cheapest vehicle. And there was a picture of Rumsfeld on the cover of the New York Post. <laughs> This giant boxer leaning out of a limo on its way to go to doggy daycare in New York. So That's luxury. Yeah, it is. Anyway, dog buses. That is the best news that I saw this week. All right, let's welcome our first guest on over to the show. John Waters is a writer, film director, actor, and visual artist. He's probably best known for his films, which include Hairspray, Pink Flamingos, and Cry Baby, among others. His latest book is a work of fiction titled Liar Mouth, which Kirkus Review described thusly, the king of campology is back and gleefully heinous as ever. Check this out. It's our conversation with the one, the only John Waters. We recorded it last year. Here it is on LiveWire. John Waters, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. My goodness. This is a real thrill for me and Elena, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, I want to talk about this novel of yours, Liar Mouth. This is your, you've written books before, but they've been in the memoir category. This is your first novel. Why did you finally decide to tackle that form? Well, I had a taste of it when I wrote my book, Carsick, when I hitchhiked across the country by myself when I was 66. And the first two-thirds of the book were I imagined the worst rides I could get and the best rides, which were fiction. <laughs> right. And then I wrote what really happened. So I had a taste for it with that. But that's much easier to write if you are one of the characters while you're hitchhiking. So I just – I love novels. I think it's uh, – I, I always read them. So I just wanted to – try things I haven't done. The same way I took LSD when I was 70 to see what it would be like. I hitchhiked when I was 66 across the country. I keep trying to dare myself. I'm the evil Knievel of uh, <laughs> nutcases, right? <laughs> Do you feel like it's working? I mean, you sound, I don't know if you are comfortable with us stating your age, but let's say you're north of 70. But you I'm sound 76, which you can't be middle-aged. I'm not going to be 152 no matter how well I things go. <laughs> I, I am in that. the winter of my years, not even the autumn, which is really shocking. But I'm going to beat death, and I wrote how I was going to do that in my last book. So I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm going to beat death. Nobody can kill this ego. <laughs> but do you, think, do you think all of this sort of experimentation in what phase some would say is later life, do you think that's having the desired effect of keeping you kind of young and healthy and active? Well, I I'm, I'm just continue to work. I'm afraid if I ever retired, I'd drop dead. But uh, I don't believe in any religion, but I like to believe in the resurrection. But I just want to know, what do you wear? I mean, are you <laughs> nude? I hope if everybody in the world came back nude, that would be really bad. I hope pets don't come too. Or where are you going to get an apartment? You think it's a problem now. <laughs> I feel like that's a premise for a John Waters film. There is some well, sort of be. resurrection. The resurrection. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Mel Gibson can produce it. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the main character in this book, Liarmouth, Marcia Sprinkle. Uh, is there a person who inspired her? No, I did have a friend that told me once his girlfriend that he had broken up was used to steal suitcases in airports. That was the only thing. That's all you need. One sentence, one little thing. You think, oh, or one thing you overhear. None of the rest was really inspired by anything true. I was just in the airport the other day and I was looking at all those like forlorn suitcases that had been like misdelivered and there's no one guarding them. And I had the thought, how are those not being stolen more regularly? 
nobody's guarding any suitcases. And you eat. the reason I got a lot of ideas is because I have been, I once was with a friend, and she picked up her suitcase, and we started walking up, and the guy started chasing it. And he had the exact same suitcase. Mm. And all you have to say is, oh, I'm sorry. I know people that have taken suitcases home and then realized it wasn't theirs and then took it back, and the other person took it back too. But uh, they don't check anymore. When I was younger, they always had someone that looked mm-hmm. at the tag mm-hmm. of your suitcase and looked at the thing. I haven't been in an airport where they do that. It's it's odd because security went much stronger in every other way after 9/11, mm-hmm. and so they got rid of that. Right. So you can't you can't bomb the planes, but you can get your suitcase stolen. This is Live Wire Radio. We're talking to the great John Waters. He's got a new novel out called Liar Mouth. Um, there is a family that makes a quick appearance in this book, and they're wearing matching T-shirts. And uh, what's written on the T-shirts, we can't really say on public radio. But it's uh, sexual and it's provocative. And I was wondering, do you like, uh, I feel like we're trying to do too much of our communicating as a society by way of our T-shirts. Do you share that opinion? Well, I hate, t- I don't ever wear a T-shirt that has a label on it that you can read or any slogan of any kind. But in Provincetown, I, I did like to see big, grumpy women with T-shirts on that said, I got issues. That made me laugh. <laughs> and, and another one I saw was a man alone, and his T-shirt said, I eat, and it was something to do that rhymes with last. And at the same time, I thought, who would just be by yourself, come to Provincetown and look in the mirror and say, well, this will be perfect for Provincetown. You know, he saved it and then put it on and walked out by himself in the middle of the day. And families were, you know, covering their children's eyes. A eight-year-old, can, a four-year-old can read that. So I just thought, well, what is he thinking? Did, did that help? Did somebody say, oh, okay, come on over. I just couldn't imagine the response, or I do too. Yeah. And that's kind of what this book is about. Right. <laughs> um, we've got to take a quick break here on Livewire, but when we come back, uh, I want to talk to John Waters about uh, his filmmaking career and uh, his relationship with the bathrooms at the Baltimore Museum of Art and a bunch of other interesting stuff. When we return here on Livewire, stay with us. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most nonstops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We are talking to filmmaker, actor, artist, writer John Waters, who has a new novel out titled Liar Mouth. Um, your filmmaking, particularly a lot of your early stuff, is often described as transgressive or employing sort of intentionally bad taste. But I was wondering, do you think it's bad taste or is it just your taste? Well, I think what bad taste is over, even I always said Trump ruined bad taste um, because it's not even fun anymore. His bad taste wasn't fun or anything. So uh, to me, I don't know that they were bad taste. They were trying to alter your perceptions of any kind of taste at all. Um, And when we made Pink Flamingos, for instance, all that 50s furniture was a nickel in a thrift shop. Now it's called you know, mid-century. And it's very collectible. And uh, the... Parents, my parents' antique furniture that they left me that was one time worth a fortune is worthless now. So taste changes, and but both at some point were extreme to have something that was so old and or something that was freshly not new. So mm-hmm. it 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 it's interesting what becomes in and out of fashion, and I think taste is what I've always written about. My audience is smart; they have a good sense of humor about themselves, but they're always a little bit angry. But they use that anger anger for humor. And that's what makes everybody get along so well. And that's why I've lasted this long doing this for 50 years. I wanted to ask about uh, somebody who was really instrumental to your career, and that would be Divine. I just watched this documentary about Divine uh, a little while ago. I'm curious, uh, you were childhood friends uh, in the suburbs of Baltimore. I mean, do you think your career would have ended up the way it's ended up had you and Divine not crossed paths? 
Well, I think I would have made movies, and I think I would have found a star of sorts that was extreme. But uh, and I didn't really meet Divine till we were teenagers, because his family uh, moved up the street. And I recently went by to where his house was, and it's gone. Somebody bought it and tore it down and built something oh, no. else, which really kind of bothered me. Uh, you know that it was just gone. And uh, yes, I think I would have made movies. Would I have found another person that was, let's say, at that time a drag queen, which Divine certainly was. Divine was not trans. He never wanted to be a woman. He didn't go and drag except when he was paid to do it, really. Hmm. Uh, would I, I don't know. You can never say that. Uh, my first movie starred Malcolm Soule, who was a very, very famous, in, uh, nationally famous beatnik that lived in Baltimore. And she had maroon hair and were all really extreme punk makeup like 30 years before there was punk. She was the queen of the beatnik. She was in Life magazine. And she was the star of my first movie. Divine was scared of her. So um, <laughs> so I would have found somebody alarming, yeah. <laughs> uh, what were your aspirations in those days, in the late 60s and 70s in Baltimore, just kind of making these these films that were really unlike anything anyone had seen. It was to scare hippies. And basically <laughs> what what I still do is make fun of the rules of the outsider community I live in. I might have made fun with hippies, but that's who came to see Multiple Maniacs. I might have made fun of liberals, but that's certainly who comes see me speak. I don't have a lot of people yelling, lock her up. <laughs> Speaking of Baltimore, uh, you're sort of famously associated with that city, and, and I believe we're speaking to you in Baltimore today. Um, yeah. w what is it about Baltimore that has kept you there and engaged all these years when you could live in L.A. or New York or San Francisco or anywhere else you choose? Because I could never escape show business if I lived in there. I'd never meet people that weren't in the arts. I have friends here that are truck drivers. I have friends here that are florists. I have people here that are criminals. I, I need to meet people that have different lives. And my oldest friends live here. And I don't trust anybody that doesn't have old friends. And <laughs> your real old friends could care less if you got a good review or made money that week mm. or anything. So, uh, And also the people here have a good sense of humor, and that is very, very important to me. And we can make fun of Baltimore. You can't. We have a, a, a segment on our show. It's called The Best News We Heard All Week. And I don't know, a few months ago, I think Elena's best news story involved the bathrooms at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Oh, yeah. Correct? What's the, what's the story with that? Well, I gave my entire art collection, which is a 40-year collection. It's valuable, and it's pretty good. I'm a good art collector. But I gave it all to the Baltimore Museum after I die. And they said, oh, we're going to name this Rotunda after you. And I said, that's fine, but I want you to name the bathrooms after me. And they said, oh, that's real funny. I said, no, <laughs> I'm serious. It's a deal breaker. That's what I want. So they actually did, and they made it the first non-gender bathroom in, a, in the museum. And I had Elizabeth Coffey, who is a trans actress that was in Pink Flamingos. And she came down, and this was 50 years later. She now is an activist for senior citizen trans rights. Wow. And she cut Hello. the ribbon and took the first pee. She christened it <laughs> in, front of, <laughs> in front of all the media. It was like the most amazing turnout, public officials. It was hilarious. It was really good. And it was a ser it was a serious subject, but we had fun with it. So we weren't preaching, and uh, and 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 I've already seen things on the internet. I can't wait to get to that John Waters bathroom. So I thought, oh God, who knows what'll go on in there? <laughs> How did you end up on The Simpsons? I was flipping the channels the other day, and I saw what is arguably one of the great Simpsons episodes starring you. Thank you. That was a long time ago. I've done a lot of voiceover work. I do Disney cartoons now. Um, they asked me to do it, and I had a great time doing that show. And, I, of course, now people, kids, used to always come up to me in airports, recognize me for that. But l later, I was in the Alvin the Chipmunk uh -huh. movie. <laughs> Wait, and were you so in the children squeakle? come up to me. Or were you in the original? I was, I, yes, I was in, uh, what was that called? It was the Christmas movie with the Chipettes, yeah. And uh, I have a scene with Alvin in it, and they later changed it and put Alvin saying, don't tell me I saw Pink Flamingos, which I couldn't believe they put that in a children's movie. <laughs> what, I, I mean, what? What's it feel like to you to be, you know, recognized in an airport by a child because of your work and some major film production and to be so sort of beloved and embraced widely when your start in doing this in filmmaking anyway was it with such an outsider community and was so not embraced widely? Well, I think I've been crossing over. I'd like to do other things. And when I'm in the subway in New York, I'm only recognized for being in the Chucky movie. <laughs> <laughs> Is this child's play? 
no, I was in uh, Seed of Chucky. Perdone moi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, the one that sounds dirtier, the dirtier, <laughs> gayer Chucky. Although the new Chucky's pretty gay, but the one on TV. But uh, it depends. I want to reach everybody in a way. I'm not a separatist. So I'm thinking, well, children can't see pink flamingos, even though children love Divine. They were never scared of Divine. They thought he was a clown. They, they weren't scared mm. of divine. Hippies were, but they weren't. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just trying to tr- cross over to different audiences. Is there a certain freedom? You have this novel that's out, Liar Mouth. Is there a certain freedom in writing a novel? Um, because you can imagine a scenario and then just write it and it exists, as opposed to trying to make a film about it, yes. where you have to then think about how this is going to show up on the big screen? Yeah, I don't have to worry about the budget. I don't have to worry about the cost of special effects. And to be honest, I don't have to worry about the MPAA rating. Mm. You know, I mean, I mean, you'd be happy if they burned your book. It would get so much publicity. Mm-hmm. Now. No, they wouldn't be that stupid to do that. Well, they might because <laughs> yeah. they're burning books again everywhere. Yeah. And then we'll have the don't say straight law. That's the one I want to pass. <laughs> no line <laughs> dancing or mention of, you know, Mel Gibson before age of four years old without being able to make up their own minds. Speaking of the, the novel, though, and, and the difference between a novel and, and a film, is there any thought about adapting Liar Mouth uh, into being a film? Well, there has been interest already, my agent said. So I love that idea because whoever wanted to make the movie would have to buy the movie rights for me, which is funny. And then uh, they'd maybe have, uh, maybe hope to hire me to direct it. So those that there's one step that would be an extra paycheck than usually I get from making a movie. So um, I hope so. That'd be great. All oh, this movie, though would probably be NC-17, and the special effects budget would be pretty high because there's a lot of strange things that happen with trampoline fanatics. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, John Waters, it's been such a pleasure uh, finally getting to talk to you. We've been fans uh, forever. And, and if, if, if you want to hear some good music, I would highly recommend you check out the CD, A Date with John Waters, which I was before we started recording, I was showing you this John Prine tattoo that I got. And I really got into John Prine because of the CD that you made that had an Iris Dement and John Prine song on it. So thanks for that. Well, sure. Thank you. You were a little late coming to John Prine because he's been around a long time. I know. Time. I was too. But uh, he's really great. And Iris Dement is so great mm-hmm. too. I mean, yeah. nobody can wear a house dress like her. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Waters, thank you again for coming on Livewire. We appreciate it. All right. It. Thank you for having me. That was John Waters right here on Livewire. There was a funny moment, Elena, before we started recording, where there was these emails that were coming in and dinging, and it was clear (laughs) that it was a bit frustrating to John, but he wasn't totally clear on how to fix it. That just proves that, like, if you want to be a great artist, don't pay attention to things like how your email works. Like, just, like, let it go, find Mm -hmm. people to do it. Delegate it. Delegate. A team of people swept into that room in Baltimore and fixed the situation. I believe one of them asked something like, um, do you know how to turn off your notifications? And he said, I don't know what that is. It was as if you had asked him, can you levitate? Yeah. Like, it was a completely ludicrous concept. (laughs) John's latest book is Liar Mouth. Uh, Go check it out right now. Hey, special thanks this episode to Sophia Barr of Hillsboro, Oregon. Sophia is part of the Livewire member community and is generously supporting our show with a donation each month, which we are very thankful for because it is how we are able to do Livewire. So thank you, Sophia, for keeping Livewire in business. This is Livewire. Of course, each week we ask our listeners a question in honor of those bathrooms that are named for John Waters. We asked our listeners, if you could have anything named after you, what would it be? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What do you see? Oh, these are so great. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Sylvia would like to be the namesake of a Taylor Swift song. Ooh. <laughs> well, I mean, I think Sylvia knows what, what they have to do. You have to date Taylor Swift yes. for some amount of time. <laughs> and, and then you will end up in a song pretty much. Yeah. Maybe two songs, the original song and then Taylor's version. So you could get right. a double a double namesake out of Just, that one. <laughs> you better you you better do right by Taylor because those Swifties are not messing around. 
No, they're maybe the most uh, socially litigious group uh, on the internet today. <laughs> no one's seen Jake Gyllenhaal for like a year. We're not even talking about it. <laughs> What's something else uh, one of our listeners would like to have named after them? Ah, I love this one from Olivia. Olivia would like to have a skateboarding trick named after them. Although there's already an Ollie. Oh, right. Olivia, Ollie. But maybe maybe a, a new trick would be appropriate. A goofy-footed stale fish. We could uh, rename that the uh, goofy-footed Olivia. Is that the name of a skateboarding move? I only know this, Elena, because I was once in a car stereo radio commercial in Seattle for a local car stereo place, and I was portraying a skateboarder, and <laughs> one of my lines as I was talking about car stereo products was, <laughs> I said, that was a cool, goofy-footed stale fish that somebody uh, just did. Wow. I would rather say Olivia for sure. I think Olivia is a way better name for that <laughs> trick, honestly. Uh, okay. One more thing that one of our listeners would like to have named after them. I'm very partial to this one from Liam. Liam says, I just want a drink in a dive bar named after me. My dreams aren't that big. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, of all the things, a skateboarding trick, a Taylor Swift song, and a drink in a dive bar, I would spend a lot more time with the latter than the first two. So Liam would get a lot more namesakingness uh, if that's what they chose. I paid 100 bucks to have one of those little kind of, um, what do you call it, like a brass little nameplate put in a dive bar in Seattle called the Baranoff. And it just says Luke Burbank. I bought this years ago and totally forgot about it. And uh, occasionally I'll stop into the bar to visit my little nameplate. Aww. David, my partner, uh, used to work at a bar in Chapel Hill, North Carolina that had a drink named after him. It was a shot of Jack Daniels can of Budweiser and one single loose Marlboro Red cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is like, I could, I could die happy knowing I had that, that drink <laughs> named for me or that whole experience, I guess you would say named for me, but also, you know, David is a pretty cool customer. Okay. You know what? Amen. We, let's sneak one more in. These are too fun. This one from Andrew is great because Andrew can't decide between two things. And let's just say they're not exactly similar. Okay. Andrew would like to be named after either a wing in the hospital where I work or a theater in Second City. <laughs> <laughs> so an improv stage or a, a place of medical attention. Those are the two options. Yeah, those are wildly different experiences in terms of the fun level. <laughs> Unless... Maybe Second City needs to have like an urgent care clinic or, you know, like a little drop in. Uh huh. Al although you don't really want your medical professional to like improv your treatment, no. I suppose. <laughs> well, I would like, I would like them to be yes and. Like, uh, you know, uh, do you think you can uh, remove this mole without leaving a terrible <laughs> scar? Yes, Mr. Burbank. I think and, you can do that. And uh, it's not covered by your insurance. Oh, great. Uh, awesome. Wah, wah. <laughs> well, at least improvers are great listeners, so they'd be a great listener. Yes, they, they'd have that going for them. All right, thanks to everyone who responded uh, to our question this week. we got another one for next week's show coming up at the end of this program, which we will reveal then, so stick around for that. In the meantime, let's invite our next guest over. Her writing has appeared in the Rumpus Literary Journal as well as a bunch of other places. Publishers Weekly called her latest book, Red Paint, the ancestral autobiography of a Coast Salish punk, a stirring debut. Time Magazine called it absorbing. Uh, I'm calling it a riveting story of someone on a journey to connect their past, present, and future. So take a listen to this. It's our conversation with Sasha LaPointe, recorded in front of a live audience at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts in Eugene, Oregon. Sasha, welcome to Livewire. Hi, thank you. Hi, thanks for being here. This is a, a really incredible book. I want to start by talking about um, your sort of traditional name, Taksha Blue, which mm -hmm. is uh, on, the, on the cover of the book and I know was your great-grandmother's name. Mm -hmm. What does that name mean and what did it mean to you to, to carry it with you in your life? Yeah, so much. Like I think in one of the early chapters, Naming Ceremony, I talk about what it's like to be gifted a Skagit name. So traditionally in our Coast Salish culture, names have to be gifted to you. And my great grandmother decided to gift me her Skagit name. So I became Taksha Blue number two, which was so intense because who my great grandmother was as 
um, a cultural revitalization activist. She kind of single-handedly saved the Lachutzi language from extinction. Wow. She was such a, a badass. <laughs> so growing up, I'd always hear, oh, you're Taksha Blue number two, and what what hard shoes to fill? And I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> did that feel like pressure as a young it person? It did. It did. Yeah. But in a good way. Um, your young life sounds like it was filled with a lot of love within your immediate family, but also with a lot of um, you know, trauma and displacement. Your family was living in a church for a while. There's a, a part of the book where uh, you talk about sort of getting dropped off by the school bus mm -hmm. and knowing that you're living in this church and kind of walking near it, but then doing that thing that kids do, really probably just people in general do when they feel shame, which is taking your time, hoping the bus leaves so you can then go into this place that you're living. What did it feel like for you to have a childhood that was sort of so disconnected at times? You know, um, you're bringing up a moment that I can remember so visually and so viscerally, doing the, the thing where I'd pretend to tie my shoes mm -hmm. and wait for the other kids in my grade to kind of disappear because I didn't want anybody to know that I was actually walking across the parking lot into the church, which was my home. You know, like that was such a hard thing. And I think that sort of displacement and that feeling of like not being grounded or home, you know, was a constant in my early childhood. And yes, it was hard. But one thing that really soothed me, and I think that I really rooted in, was a story that my great grandmother told me growing up where she was also really nomadic as a Coast Salish woman. Oh, you mean Taksha Blue One? Taksha Blue One. The, the, <laughs> yeah, OG. the OG. The OG, <laughs> yes. Her and her parents also had a very nomadic life growing up on the Skagit River. She would tell me these stories about having to pick up everything, literally get in the canoe and go up the river to search for work. Her parents were, you know, either doing the berry picking during the summer seasons, and she would say we'd often like stay in different places, but her mother had a rolled up piece of linoleum and would lay it down wherever they were. Sometimes it was on a riverbank. Sometimes it was in, you know, one room shack with no paint and dirt floors. But she would say that her mother would roll out the linoleum mm. and create home wherever they were. Mm. When she told me that story, I was kind of like, oh, that's such a bummer. And she was like, no. Mm. My mom knew how to make, make us feel that we had a home all the time. Mm. Wow. We're talking to Sasha LaPointe. Her book is Red Paint, the Ancestral Autobiography of a Coast Salish Punk, here on Livewire at the Holt Center in Eugene. Um, you also write in the book about your love uh, for the show Twin Peaks, which yes. <laughs> was set in the part of the Pacific Northwest, kind of roughly where you grew up, and had at least one native character, even if there were some stereotypes in play. Oh, yeah. um, and then it also kind of, in a way, pushed you in the direction of the, the person you ended up marrying mm -hmm. because of their resemblance to what? Um, Agent Cooper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. What did you love so much about Twin Peaks? Um, I think as a child, it was really exciting for me to see Coast Salish representation even at all, like native representation. The shows I loved, the music I loved, there was sort of this absence of native characters and this absence of Native identity in general. And so when I saw Twin Peaks and saw Deputy Hawk, Deputy Hawk. <laughs> I mean, with his turquoise earring and a <laughs> ponytail, and he was a tracker, I was like, come on. But, you know, my young self was excited to be like, oh, this is set in basically my backyard. I'm seeing things that resemble home. You know, the logging trucks, the deep woods, the waterway. Like, it was really comforting to be like, oh, people, that visibility was important to me. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Agent Cooper. Yeah. How could you not love him? Yeah. He's magical. <laughs> um, we are recording uh, this here this week in Eugene, Oregon, but not too far up I-5 is the city of Olympia, Washington, which is kind of the birthplace of what's described as the riot girl uh, music scene, uh, the band Bikini Kill is referenced frequently in this book. I'm curious, why did that music speak to you so much um, in your young life, um, and, and what was its importance? Yeah, I can remember, um, I love this question because I'm currently working on a collection of essays, and one of them has to deal with this moment exactly. Um, I remember being 13 years old. I grew up, you know, in the middle of the woods on the Swinomish Reservation, far away, kind of removed from... Seattle and the music scene and all of the things that were happening there. 
but I remember listening to the like college radio station, the alternative radio station as this little 13 year old kid. And it was the first time I heard Bikini Kill's song, White Boy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would uh, steal my brother's boom box and drag it into the bathroom and kind of lock myself in and just listen to this radio station and make really bad mixtapes. And I was, <laughs> you know, I was like... Did you get, get those tapes going where you would hear the beginning and end of what the DJ was saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I, you could never really time it perfectly, no. so there'd be like a... I had like repeat songs. I had like, I cut songs off. I, they were the worst mixtapes ever. But that was the first time I remember hearing Bikini Kill and it really shook me to my core because I was hearing like a young woman sing about the aftermath of sexual assault and in such a powerful way, in such a way that just commanded attention. And I'd never heard anything like that in my entire life. And as an assault survivor, it really spoke to me. And I was like, I want that. I want to find that. I want to be part of that. I want to be close to that. And Bikini Kill became one of my favorite bands of all time. We're talking to Sasha LaPointe about her new book, Red Paint, here on Livewire this week. Um, another uh, event that you write about in the book that was very traumatic um, was that you had a miscarriage. And that's something that is traumatic for anyone and people, I would imagine, um, deal with their grief in different ways. The way that you write in the book that you did was you went to the Skagit River, the very, very cold Skagit River, and entered the river. Um, I'm wondering why, why you did that and, and what that felt like for you, and did it have the healing effect that you were seeking? It did. Um, you know, after I went out to the river, and I remember just asking, it was you know, two of my best friends that drove me out there in Skagit Valley past Cedra Woolley on the old Skagit Highway, and we just kept driving and driving and driving until finally, I, and I didn't have a plan. I didn't know where I was going. I was just like, I know that I need to be in this river. And we pulled off on the side of the road, and I found an old boat launch, and I was like, this works. This will be perfect. And I got in the river and, you know, did my ritual, did my sort of personal healing ceremony and a couple days later I was talking to my mom and I told her where I was I was like yeah we were out by Hamilton past Cedra Woolley whatever and she said oh my gosh if you would have gone to the next mile marker there's a creek that breaks off from the river and that's where our ancestors gathered red paint like the clay like, it was a sacred site, and I had no idea. Wow. Wow. And so if you're asking me if I found what I was looking for, I did. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, I mean, the title of the book is Red Paint, and this red paint, it, it sort of features prominently in the narrative of this book. Can you, for, for people that would be unfamiliar, describe culturally why this is so significant to your family and to your people? Yeah, um, as a Coast Salish person, um, we have longhouse ceremonies. And in our longhouse ceremonies, there are different dancers who wear different paint. And I come from a lineage who specifically wears red paint. And I remember um, being in the longhouse as a child and asking my mom, what does this paint mean? What does this paint mean? And she told me that the red paint meant we were the medicine workers, we were the healers. And so whatever spiritual work that was happening in the longhouse, when the red paint dancers came out to dance around the fire, they were healing. Yeah. And that was the same paint that was that was sort of taken from just down the down the river on the yes. Skagit. And you had no idea at that time. I had time. no idea. Wow. When my mom told me, I was floored. And my mom kind of just nodded and was like, yeah, of course you ended up right there. That's where wow. you were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you write in this book is that healing is different than self-medicating. What do you mean by that exactly? I think that for a long time in my teenagehood and early 20s, I wasn't necessarily facing the things that I'd experienced around sexual violence and trauma, generational trauma, historical trauma as a Native person, and also experienced trauma, like lived trauma. And I wasn't really confronting that and dealing with it in a good way. Rather, I was sort of putting it to sleep and numbing it, going to punk shows and being wild. And when I finally started to confront it and be like, oh, girl, you need some more tools to like deal with this. Like the work of healing is so much harder and way more worthwhile than self-medicating. You can put things to sleep all the time, but 
to really work through them. You have to be present. Yeah, that I think really sums up the message of this book really perfectly. The book is Red Paint. Sasha LaPointe, thank you so much for coming on Livewire. That was Sasha LaPointe, recorded at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts in Eugene, Oregon. Sasha's book, Red Paint, The Ancestral Autobiography of a Coast Salish Punk, was a winner of the 2023 Pacific Northwest Book Award, and it is available now. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarello right over there. We've got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because on the other side, we will hear some music from the incredible band Deep Sea Diver. So stay with us. Welcome back to Livewire. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get to our musical guest this week, a little preview of next week's show, we are going to be talking to Kenji Lopez Alt, the renowned chef and New York Times bestselling author. He's also the host of the YouTube series Kenji's Cooking Show. We're going to talk to him about his latest book, The Walk Recipes and Techniques. I'm telling you, Elena, that book is for real. I have been making things. That's not true. My girlfriend has been making things <laughs> using the book, and it is really, really cool. So you're going to want to tune in for that. Uh, we're also going to get some stand-up from the very funny Sarah Schaefer. Now, this isn't just any stand-up comedy. Sarah is going to teach you, the Livewire listeners, how to do comedy in three easy steps. Then we're going to finish up the show with some music from the indie rock band Dead. And as always, we're going to be looking to get your answer to our listener question. Elena, what are we asking the listeners for next week's show? Oh, we would like for you, please, to tell us about your most ambitious DIY project. Oh, gosh. That's a good one for you, Burbank. I am in the midst of one right now. I'm trying to remodel this house, and sometimes I just stand in the yard crying. So it's going well so far. If you have a less depressing answer to that question, reach out on Twitter or Facebook. We're at Live Wire Radio. All right, our musical guest this hour is a Seattle rock band that's received acclaim for their power and presence and also their larger-than-life guitar hooks. Their third full-length album, Impossible Weight, is out now. Take a listen to this. It's Deep Sea Diver performing their song Shattering the Hourglass at Revolution Hall in Portland, Oregon.
can't set me free. Thank you, Patty King, everybody. <laughs> Elliot Jackson. Thank you, guys. That was Deep Sea Diver right here on Livewire, recorded at Revolution Hall in Portland, Oregon. Their latest album, Impossible Weight, is out now. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the show. A huge thanks to our guests, John Waters, Sasha LaPointe, and Deep Sea Diver. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sepchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing manager is Paige Thomas. And our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer, and our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Arts Commission, a state agency funded by the state of Oregon and the National Endowment for the Arts. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank member Sophia Barr of Hillsboro, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.